For any of you who do any traveling south of the border, uh, you'll know something of the violent storms that hit the eastern coast of, of the states there, down the North Carolina uh, region there, every winter time. It seems that if there's any snowstorm, a hurricane that's around, it seems to be that part of the coastline that really gets hit hard. Um, it's a very interesting area. It's a haven, actually, for deep-sea divers because uh, many ships have gone down, hundreds of ships, in fact, and divers love to go into that area and explore the shipwrecks uh, that have happened there. They actually call it the graveyard of the Atlantic. We're talking about the U.S. Life Saving Service. Um, very interesting. I, I, I learned about these some years ago, um, a story that I'd, what, that I'd sort of heard on the TV, a documentary. And it's these group of men that, uh, against all the, the odds, if you want to call it that, the terrible conditions that are there, these men would go out to rescue people who were at distress on the sea. Usually it was an eight-man rescue team. Um, they tell me that uh, you can still go to that area today, and about every seven miles or so, you'll find this large white hut, bigger than a hut, really, a building, which is just set back from the beach where these men would await uh, when these uh, storms hit and people are in distress. I'll share one story, which was typical of what went on in that time. One of the major storms of the 19th century, there was one team of seven men who went out to rescue four men in a very light craft. And when the rescue team did get out to the small craft, all they could see was the mast and these four men hanging on for dear life. <clears throat> the actual rescue took eight hours, but it was actually 22 hours from the time they left the hut and got out there and got back. They say that when those men got back, they were totally exhausted. And remarkably, nobody lost their life, although that wasn't the case in a lot of the rescues that took place. Now, for your interest, there's a movie that came out just about six months ago. So you won't be able to see it in the theater anymore, but you probably get a DVD. And it's called The Finest Hours. Anybody seen that movie by chance? You know what I'm talking about here, don't you? True story. Same thing, almost a carbon copy of what I was just talking about. Now, I won't, I, my wife always gets me when I talk about movies because I'm going to tell you the end and then you won't see it. So I'm not going to tell you the end. <laughs> but I will tell you something of the details of the, the situation itself. But here were four men that went out, terrible conditions. And uh, it was actually two tankers that had collided in the Atlantic area down there. And there were 30 men that were lost out there at sea. And these four men went out to rescue them. And uh, I won't tell you anymore because it's just really worth seeing. But the thing that I found very interesting about the life, U.S. life saving team, rescue team, is that each man, before they go, they commit themselves to their partner who they're going with. They promise that whatever happens, they will stick with them, never mind what. In fact, the motto of the U.S. Life Saving Team is a very interesting one. It says this, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Commitment. This is what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the determined will, the steadfast heart, as it sometimes is talked about in, in old language. And that is that once a person's mind is made up and they know it's the right thing to do, they'll stick with it, whatever. Very rare that people will do that. We're very good at bringing, uh, bringing up contracts, aren't we? And we'll commit to a contract, but how good are we at keeping that contract? People make these commitments, but if it isn't working out and they feel, ah, that was probably a mistake anyway, then they'll walk away from it. People promise to show up and do something, but it's a nice day. Well, I don't really need to go down there. Somebody else can do that. People stand at God's altar and they make a promise that for life they will stick together. And then something happens. I've always said, the marriages that break up are the ones that, uh, that, that I like are the ones where people have done everything possible to make that marriage stick before they say this just possibly can't happen anymore. But no, most people just say, that's nah, not working give it up, go and find some other avenue to travel. And society 
supports the decision. And what's so tragic about all of this is that so often the decisions that are being made are made very sincerely. But in the end, circumstances win over commitment. If you want to turn back to the scriptures into Psalm 57, you'll probably find at the top of the psalm words similar to this. And it says this to um, Psalm of David. It says, when he had fled from Saul into the cave. If I had 45 minutes, like a lot of preachers do, I'd spend a lot of time telling you about David and this story and others like it to show the kind of commitment that David had. And you'd be impressed by the fact that when he makes a decision, he sticks by that decision. Even after experiencing some of the most horrendous circumstances that would make many of us bail out. David was being pursued by a maniac. None other than the first king of Israel, King Saul. And Saul would not stop until David was dead. Um, Deeply conscious of Samuel's anointing, David had committed himself to ministry. He could see what was happening with the king's rule, and people were being mistreated terribly in, in, in many instances. And so he was trying to help these people that King Saul was given such misery to. And of course, Saul was not happy. He was concerned that the people were getting very used to David, and they really wanted him to be the king. And Saul knew that one day, if he did not do away with David, David probably would be the king. And so he sought his life. And so what does David do? Well, with death all around him, David runs and he eventually hides in the cave. And that's why it says, when he fled from Saul into the cave. And who would blame him? For a person like David, whom we saw last week in Psalm 131, living so close to God, the the commitment to a promise quickly takes over. You know, you can actually split Psalm 57 into two. Verses 1 to 6 are all about David where he's on the run. But then you get to verse 7 and it changes. And David remembers that he had made a promise. That never mind what happens, God is around me. My heart is steadfast, O God, he says. Now, the word steadfast is a word that we don't use much today. But listen how the dictionary defines steadfastness. It says, firmly fixed in faith or devotion to duty, constant, unchanging. The church could stand more people today whose hearts are settled, are fixed, firm, immovable. Hearts that are de- determined, established. Three words that I want to throw at you this morning that they go with a steadfast spirit. And the first word is discernment. These will come up one at a time. To discern, we use the mind. The second word is desire. You might say that the emotions kick in when we talk about the desiring of something. And finally, this word deciding. And we decide with our will. So with the outline in mind, let's look into Psalm 57. And the first thing to note is this word discernment, the workings of the mind. Now, you'll agree with me that nobody in their right mind would enter into any decision without first of all weighing up in their minds all the consequences that go with making that decision. Here is David in the cave. He's frightened, frightened out of his skin. And he begins to draw on the things that he knows. The very first thing that he talks about or realizes is that God is his refuge. He remembered that. This is a desperate, disastrous situation that he's in. Many people can't be trusted. The king himself can't be trusted. And so he knows that he's being betrayed on every side. He doesn't know who he can trust any longer. But one thing that he does know is that God can be trusted. And that's why it says in that very first verse, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings. In the Old Testament, God allowed himself to be betrayed as an eagle. Under his mighty wings, it says, he supports and shelters his young. When you come to the New Testament, you find a different picture. Jesus was all the time talking about being like a mother hen, and he talked about we being little chickens. But it's the same thing. He wanted to protect them under his wings. 
In Psalm 91, the psalmist goes even deeper with this. And the description, he talks about God having feathers. And again, everything about that picture speaks to the, the desire that God has. That he wants more than anything else the experience of sheltering his spiritual children from the evil forces in the world that would do harm to them. I wonder where David first saw this picture. Maybe it was his forefathers, the Israelites. You remember those times when they were walking through the desert? And everywhere that they went, they took that portable tabernacle with them and they set it up. Very special to them, very sacred. And right in the center of their camp, uh, was the, 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 the holy place and the holy of holies. And there was what was called the Ark of the Covenant. And if you've ever taken the time to, to study that whole picture, it's fascinating because the Ark of the Covenant was a great big box and there was the, 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 the angels on the, on the top who were looking down and their arms are like wings that were spread over the top. And that's where the blood would be poured when they did the sacrifice. And it's like as if that blood is being protected. It's a very sacred moment. And I wonder if we, in our experience, if our hearts are fixed on the same matter, to look beyond the physical dangers and to know that Jesus has gone to the cross for us. He has shed his blood for us. And this day and age, we don't talk much about the blood in the church. People say, oh, we don't want to talk about blood. That's not a nice thing to talk about. But we're talking about the blood of Jesus. It's precious. It's sacred. Because it would have been our blood and not his blood that would have been shed if God had had his way. And so that's something about the protection, the spiritual protection that we see in the blood of Jesus Christ. Read on. David also discerned something else that was useful to him. Now he says, there's someone that I can trust here. And it says in verse 2, it says, I cry out to God most high. Now, this is quite an unusual term to use because in David's world, God was not known so clearly as we would know God today. We just say he's God. You hear Jehovah, but there isn't too many names that we have. But back in those days, there were all sorts of names for God. It wasn't so much that he was divided in person, but in function. For instance, uh, to one person, he might have been Al Shaddai, which means God of the mountain. Sometimes he was known as El Hanan, which is a gracious God. Then there's El Kana, who is a jealous God. And I have identified four other gods, and I use the God with a small g here. Four other gods that each have a function to go along with their name. You see, in that somewhat primitive name, El, E-L, as it is, was simply known as God. Now, in the Canaanite religion, where they had many, many gods, E-L, L, as you would say before the, the, the word of God, it was reserved as top God. But then the Israelites came along, and they improved on this by expanding God's name from El to El Yom. Now, this is getting a bit technical, and you'd have to understand the Hebrew to, to know what I'm saying here, but it's quite simple. El Yom simply means top God, most high. And so what David is saying, he's saying, come on, wake up. I know top God, most high, God almighty, king of kings, Lord of lords, God of gods. And in him, he says, I take refuge. Not just a God for this, that, and the other, but a God who's God over everything. Now in that same verse, in verse 2, David discerns and remembers something else. It says that he fulfills his purpose for me. And I started to think about that. What does this actually mean? Well, the ama amazing thing about this is that not only is he top guard and this, this, you know, this important character that's out there, but when it says he fulfills his purpose for me, he realizes that he's a personal God. I can know this top God in my life. And he was humbled by that. Have you discerned that? Is your heart fixed on that? That amidst all the circumstances of life, that God loves you individually? He does. He knows you by your name, the scriptures tell us. There is no greater demonstration of his love than to find in the scriptures that he knows you. The Apostle Paul said this, If God did not spare his only son, but freely delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all? All things. 
Romans 8 and 32. So much of this area in life we need to discern. But now look at the second word, the word desire. David now appeals to his emotions. And if you look down at verse 5, it says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Now, I'm impressed here because this is just a very brief prayer that David is making to God. But it's a very unusual prayer. Remember, this is a calamitous situation. Remember, or, or rather I should say, whenever we're in a calamitous situation, we very often put our shopping list before God and tell him what we want him to do for us. David could have been saying, Lord, get me out of this mess. But no. He says this, Lord, in all the midst of my troubles, I want you to do something for yourself. That even while I'm going through my hell, use this situation to bring glory to yourself so that even cynics and skeptics will come to you impressed by what you have done and what you're doing in my life. He says, Lord, if this is bringing you glory to your name, then change nothing. Now, I know this kind of approach is a very unpopular one because our prayer gatherings are always dominated with selfish prayers. You know, we have the prayer of deliverance from illness. And that's usually the top thing that we go to God for. And there's nothing wrong with this because the scriptures tell us through James, pray for those that are ill and the Lord will heal them. But sometimes we get a little bit too strong with that and we command God that that person will be healed. And that's the way it's got to be every time. There's a, a pastor by the name of Ollie Hall Hallersby. He said this once himself, really not well. He said, Lord, if it be your glory, heal suddenly. He said, Lord, if it will glory you more, heal gradually. If, if it will glory you even more, may your servant remain sick a while. And if it will glory your name still more, then take your servant to be by yourself in heaven. Now, we don't quite say, be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be all over the earth. But we do say, and we said it earlier, and we even sang it in that song. I wonder if you realize what you were singing this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here it is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. It's the same thing. All that ultimately matters in life is that he is glorified and his will is fulfilled. Can you get your head around that? It's not easy, is it? And so the psalmist is discerned and he's desired. And on the basis of those things, he now says, I have come to a decision. And now David, really in this psalm, he really lets it go. He lets everybody know through his writings that he is determined to carry this thing through. Never mind what happens. Um, Notice the recurring in this psalm, the two little words that I will. Now, you'll find it in the first verse where he says, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings. But now from verse 7, four times, he says, I will sing and make music. In verse 8, I will awaken the dawn. In verse 9, I will sing of you among the peoples. And there's another one, oh, it says one before it, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. He's basically saying, Lord, it's all about you. He says, I will take my harp, my lyre, my tambourine, my brass instrument, or any instrument for that matter, and I will use it to make music to God, coming from my heart, for I will praise him. Such resolve, you cannot help but be impressed. And I say, friends, this is what we need. This is what our world needs. We need people who would discern the things of God, people who would desire the things of God, and then people who will come to a decision and they will stick with that decision. I've already mentioned about the trouble that we have in our world. About uh, 16 years or so ago now, it must be, uh, Zimbabwe was going through a very difficult time. Still isn't the greatest of countries to go, although it's a lot safer than it used to be. You might remember when the white farmers were kicked out of there and um, some terrible things happened uh, at that time. And uh, I came across a cutting at that time. Well, actually, it wasn't a cutting. It's something that I read and I cut it out. 
And when I was going through my material again, I came across it once again. And it's one of the most remarkable pieces of writings that I've ever heard. It's all about a pastor who was serving in Zimbabwe at that time. And much like David, when he saw how King Saul was treating the people, he couldn't be quiet about it, and he had to speak up. They tried to silence him. He wouldn't be silenced. He was warned that uh, if he kept opening his mouth, he would be killed. He decided that uh, I have to do what I've got to do, and in fact, he was murdered. But not before they found this cutting on his desk. It's one of the most incredible pieces of writing I think I've ever read. Listen to this. They found it on his desk. It says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be tops. I don't have to be recognized. I don't have to be praised. I don't have to be regarded, and I don't have to be rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean in his presence. I walk by patience. I'm uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. He says, I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must work till he comes. Give till I drop. Preach till all know and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me because my banner will be clear. You ever heard anything like that? Could I be that person? Could you be that person if you were put in that kind of situation? God only knows. He gives us the grace to be his disciple. And none of us would ever know how we would react. But never miss the determination, the steadfast spirit that that man, when one day he said, I'm going to serve the Lord, never mind what it cost. And it cost him his life. We don't ask for that sort of sacrifice this morning. But you know, we do make promises. And as I look around this building, this morning, I do see those of you that are in Salvation Army uniform, just like I am as well. It's not one person who'd be in Salvation Army uniform unless they made a promise that there would be a Salvation Army soldier. And I recognize that uh, not everybody, everybody wears uniform these days, so there's probably others here as well who have signed that same uh, Articles of War. And uh, this is good, and I'm not suggesting that this makes us any better than any other Christian. Because I understand that to come to Jesus, you don't have to sign anything. You just make a promise to him, and that's as binding as any piece of paper out there. And we do. We make our promise to him. I wanted to use a song this morning because it comes very close to what I'm saying right now. It's 862, if you actually, the words will be coming up on the screen. I'm sorry, they are there, my, my apologies. But just look at the words. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. What a beginning statement that is. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle, and if thou art by my side, and of course he's promised to do that, 
nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. And then it goes into other words, and you'll see them as we read through the psalm. But then he ends again with the same thing in the fourth verse. O Jesus, thou hast promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. We're going to use this song. And of course, it's an opportunity for every one of us to reflect on what we've listened to this morning. But more than that is listen to what God is saying to you this morning. And if the place of prayer is where you need to be, then you know that you can make that small step. But you can make that promise right in the seat where you are this morning. You can renew that promise. Most of us will be renewing the promise because we made that promise years ago. But make these moments special as we sing this song together. <clears throat> you that you are a master and our friend and Lord help us each one to promise everything to you and to stand by that and to carry it through until we meet you Lord just bless us now and go with us I pray in your name Amen. Amen Please stand